Mum said, you're better than Mick Jagger. You said, come on. <laughs> I know that, but I have to say. <laughs> Uh, okay. Throw it up. There we go. Robert Plant's brand new album, solo album, Pictures at 11, right? And uh, 1979, you said there wouldn't ever be a solo album. So now here you are. And in a way, coming kind of, coming, I hate to use the word, but coming out of semi-retirement in a way. You of I like the way you've changed it from <laughs> retirement on that board there to semi-retirement. <laughs> No. Well, in a way, it's semi-retirement. You haven't performed or put an album out in some time. We haven't had a Zeppelin album out since what? Since uh, In Through the Outdoor. Mm -hmm. And that was in 79. And uh, nothing from you and no word one way or the other. But had you always kind of planned to do a solo album ever since uh, you realized maybe the, the demise of Led Zeppelin had come about? Well, I think you just take things as they come. And initially I was working with the Honey Drippers playing around the clubs and that was totally satisfying. It was no big deal. Could you explain to the audience what the, who the Honey Drippers are? Well, the name speaks for itself. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, it doesn't. It was just a pickup rhythm and blues band, which began uh, very shakily. A guy who I know, who lives locally, <clears throat> played with Savoy Bram and Fleetwood Mac. His name is Andy Sylvester. He was quite a well-known blues in the blues field, and he'd been offered to do a little gig locally. It's no big deal. And he came to me and he said, "Look, we've got this band. How do you fancy singing?" I said, "I don't fancy singing at all." And then he started reeling off the kind of material that they intended to do. And my ears pricked up. It just sounded great. It sounded like where I came in, really. Um, we rehearsed maybe twice. Taught the sax players how to play in tune. You know, they have to adjust the thing on the end there. And off we went. We did one gig, and it was great. Maximum crowd, 125 people. Is that yeah, earth shattering. <clears throat> One of the nice things too, and, and there were so many people I think that are watching MTV now who have been fans of yours for some time, but went around at the beginning for Led Zeppelin, so they're not really all that familiar with Zeppelin's roots and your roots in particular. So when you said when he had said those magic words of the kind of music he was going to be playing, could you? Uh, yeah, it was him? just old fifties rhythm and blues, sort of Chicago blues, Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf. The Howlin' Wolf stuff was great because <clears throat> that really suits when I let go and sing. I mean. It's just great. It's a great medium in which to sing. So we just pursued that. Then the idea came up. A lot of these guys didn't have very much bread and they didn't have any bands to play in. So we decided to take it on the road for four days a week. No weekends because of the soccer, of course. <laughs> you know, <coughs> and just You're still involved it. in soccer that heavily? Well, I'm getting a little uh, <laughs> retirement, I think is the word. <laughs> I think I have to uh, take it easy now. I'm substitute most of the time. But it was good. It started me off again. It, it allowed me to get within a couple of yards of the audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, it was one of those, if I wasn't singing right, somebody would say, hey, you can do better than that. It was great. It was very nice. And as time went on, and that sort of went on for about two or three months, I began to think, well, there's a bit, little bit more to it than this. Yes. And so there was. The guitarist who was playing, one of the guitarists in the Honey Drippers' name was Robbie Blunt. And we started working just you know, something to do, see if we could write something. Really? Now, when you were working with Robbie Blunt, were you working, <coughs> I mean, like, together, in conjunction, or would he go off and, and write the music and you'd write the lyrics, or would you actually sit down together like... Oh, we just sat down together. Yeah. yeah. Was that well, strange for you after years of just doing that with Jimmy and John Paul and Bonzo? Oh, well, obviously, there was... <coughs> I kept harking back and thinking, gosh, this is quite comfortable. It works okay, you know. But I'd known him for a long time anyway, so, I mean, it was just a little weird <coughs> enveloping him into what I wanted to do and he to me too but I mean we got used to it, it took a couple of days and then we started started pouring out it's nice on the new album you also used two drummers mm -hmm. uh, Cozy Powell and Phil Collins is doing so well right now with Genesis uh, why two drummers? well it's quite simple really Cozy was very involved with Michael Schenker I don't know whether you've heard of Michael Schenker yes. <clears throat> so he only had a short amount of time it was one of those things where it was a suck it and see situation mm -hmm. if you know uh, it, it was like a rehearsal situation that may or may not have gone any farther and Cozy said well I've got a couple of weeks if you're gonna really go for it I'll come down for a couple of weeks and work with you and in the two weeks that he was with us we rehearsed and we recorded just like I've never been gone and slow dancer and I said, well, maybe it's still a demo situation, you know, we'll have to see. <coughs> Needless to say, it wasn't. Now, Phil Collins recently just really, well, I shouldn't say recently, it's been about a year now, but completed his first solo album. 
uh, in any way, because this is the first time that I know of that you worked outside of a group situation mm -hmm. in recording an album. Did he help you in, in any way adjust to that? Uh, yeah, he gave me a lot of confidence because <clears throat> I was so used to working in, in a very close-knit team. And he said, well, what you've got to do is go for it, you know? That's why I'm here now. He said, no, you just get out there and go. You, you, this was during the making of the record was Phil. He said, it's going to be great. You've got to put yourself, you've got to make yourself available. You've got to push, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. And I really needed that kind of help too, because I mean, I had, as I say, been in that camp for so long that, that suddenly I was standing alone going, oh, so much I can do. And he was a great help, mm. apart from being an incredible drummer. Yeah, I mean, the pair of them were great for two totally different reasons. I mean, the one, Cozy was all power and right foot and lots of turning up in the studio until we, everybody was going, oh, no, no more, you know. <coughs> I submit. <laughs> and Phil, on the other hand, was a different kind of technician. But uh, they were both very important. And listening to the album the other day, individual songs stand out for different reasons on the album to me. Fat Lip. Which is the song? <laughs> all right, yeah. it stands out. It's very catchy. Has really all the hooks for a possible single. Now I know in, when you were within uh, Zeppelin and within the confines of those parameters that were set up, I think other than Immigrant Song, you never released a single before. Yeah, there were a right? few here, weren't there? Yeah, so it didn't, you didn't concern yourself with singles. Would you concern yourself with a single on this album if one seemingly uh, was lurking about, like maybe Fat Lip? I'd concern myself with anything that's uh, going forward. You know, I mean, I don't know whether it's. There are people who maybe never listen to Zeppelin or there are young kids around the corner who perhaps are not aware of what I've done in the past. And really what I'm talking about is the future, the present and the future. It's like what's going on ahead. So if a single is going to uh, open the door to what I'm doing, that's great. Fat Lip's quite funny actually because there ain't a drummer on it. There's no drums at all, it's just that rhythm box, you know. And uh, <coughs> Cozy was most frustrated. He thought it was disgusting that there should be a track that I'm involved in. which <laughs> didn't have somebody flailing away. <laughs> he was insistent on playing the drums in the solo part. And we had to usher him out of the door and gag him and keep him quiet for a while. <laughs> but singles, yeah, I mean, again, anything goes, really. And that's good. Also now, I think what's have been happening since you've, in a way, been in retirement <laughs> is that video has come on strong, which is why we have MTV. And uh, as I told you before, we're 24 hours a day and we're seven days a week, which means we have to have an awful lot of product, and people are putting that product out. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, <clears throat> would you possibly be concerned in, in making a video, especially something from this album, which would be very nice? Yeah, uh, again, I mean, it's, just, it's quite straightforward. It'd be great to see... I've seen so many good videos, and I've seen a hell of a lot of real tacky ones, ones where there hasn't been a great deal of thought put into it, or people have done the best they can. In trying to create a pictorial image of any of the tracks on that album, I would be so critical and so analytical that probably people might do a fantastic job, and I would never be particularly content that the imagery matched up to what I see in the music. But it's a new, it's not a new feel, but it's in an experimental stage in many areas. But there's some uh, excellent directors that are coming about now, like Russell Mulcahy <coughs> and Godley and Kramer used to be in mm. TCC, doing splendid work. Getting back to the album, the mix on Pledge Pen is like, uh, reminds me of Zeppelin in, all, in a way, but one of the things you did, which I thought was odd since you're putting out a solo album, is that you put the drums and the bass up front and your voice on that particular track uh, is back a bit. And I was wondering, uh, since you did produce the album yourself, why you did that? <laughs> My ears had gone... <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't know. I mean, on Pledge Pin, I, it was, there was so much of a rhythm track there. It was really rocking without anything else on it at all. Uh, in fact, there were other pieces and other parts on the 24-track on the master that were there. But it sounded so cluttered because Phil and the bass player, Paul, were going crazy. And there wasn't a great deal of room for anything else anyway. And the voice, the vocal on that track, it's so removed from the actual, the dynamics of the track intentionally. It's like melodic while the rest of the track's flailing away, pounding away. That it just, it just required that mix to me. Like I said, you produced the album yourself. Now, in the past, all the Zeppelin albums were produced by Jimmy Page. Did you enjoy producing this album? I mean, this is the first time you actually were in, you were in total control, isn't it? Well, yeah, I was in total control. I had a lot of help. Benji Lefebvre, our sound man, is mm. still with me plucking away. And every time anything goes a bit awry, he sort of hits me in the, hits me in the arm, so I've got a permanent bruise. And the engineer, Pat Moran, was extremely mm -hmm. diligent and had a lot of patience. But 
It was great. I mean, it was uh, something I didn't really realise how long it was going to take and how tiring it was and all that sort of thing. But at the same time, at the end of the day, when you'd done it, you could say, well, that's it. I've done it. Mm -hmm. It's great. But you did rely on those people in case you were going in the wrong direction to give you a little shock. Well, I mean, if I got a bit tired or a bit sort of, you know, where's the nearest club or something like that, <clears throat> I'd get a quick wallop. Now, appropriately Now, so. the big, big question, I'm sure, that uh, everyone would really love to know, because... Uh, Do I dress to the left or the right? <laughs> I didn't, no, I said that to you in 1975. <laughs> yeah, you did. You're still using old lines. Listen. No, I didn't think it was an old line. It's that old. Nobody remembers oh, it. Oh, you know it. <laughs> Listen, are you going to tour on this particular, with this particular album to support the album? We'd love to see you on stage. And I'm not even asking. I want to know, since you're doing all these new things, now you're interested in video. A couple of years ago, you said, mm, no, I don't care about films. Now you're possibly interested in singles, if it can help them. Yeah, no, and now... How about touring? Of course, nothing's better than getting your, your face out there yeah. and seeing you on, a, on stage. Well, the doors are open to everything, except for touring. <clears throat> I mean, I can't tour with... Pictures at 11 goes on for... or lasts for about 45 minutes, and that don't really allow you time to get on stage and just do one album and leave it at that. Listen, I don't have any more material. Yeah, but you've played to some of the largest rock and roll audiences in the world, and it's quite true. I mean, possibly along with the Stones and the Who, I don't know anyone who else, else has ever played to such huge audiences. Don't you miss performing a little bit? Well, I do perform. But when you say that, do I miss crowds? Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ocean. <clears throat> yeah, I, mi I miss I mean, you did that. a song called The Ocean about that. And mm. I remember once, in fact, it was even longer than that, back around 73, and you once told me that stepping out on stage, you know, and, and feeling that surge come from the crowd, you know, I can't even really say what you said, but in other words, it was a big rush. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess I've got, I mean, it's like, um, I don't know, I, spe I suppose it's like being in the desert and waiting to get back to green again, to back to, you know, the other extreme. I have to wait because I don't have enough material. I mean, it's, it's quite practical, it's quite straightforward. What would I do after I played those songs? There's nothing left to play. Yes, and also, the, I, I, would you think maybe being hesitant too, I, I'm sure, because we talked about that before, you wouldn't want to go out there and they're going to start yelling all the, the, the big Zeppelin songs, Kashmir, whatever. Uh, and would you feel obligated to do that? No. Mm -hmm. No. Those songs belong with a certain bunch of guys and they don't belong with anybody else. I mean, it's either that or go to Vegas and do the whole lot in a, med a medley, you know? Mm -hmm. Just wanted to know how you felt about that because I've seen uh, a lot of bands do that recently. Mm. You know, go back to old material that was made with a set group of people. Uh, Led Zeppelin was one of the top touring bands of all time. Have you ever thought, and, and since you've had this time, I sit back and just think about all of that. Have you ever thought about why? Because you weren't a band I think I know that why. was in the public's <clears throat> eye so much. Well, I think that was one of the things. And also the fact that we were, it was very seldom that we were bad. I mean, we were bad lots, but it was very seldom that we, were, we didn't deliver the goods, you know? <clears throat> and when you're working with just four people, it can, it gets so close, so tight, and it's obviously, it's apparent to everybody. <clears throat> but there are a lot of four-piece bands who are the same. It's just that that was the way for us. And it came across, I think it came across really well. Right, yeah. I saw the results. Yeah, so I knew the way. <laughs> well, I saw this result. I've been lucky too because you and I met in that first tour and I followed it all the way through and seen that happen and just see it grow huge. I know. Yeah. I, I remember you used to come up to me and uh, I didn't know what to say about what had happened. Every time I saw you, if it was once every six months or something, I'd just look at you and go, what, do I, what can I tell you? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. The critics were often hard on Led Zepp. <clears throat> As you know, uh, really do you know, I'm, I'm sure that Nebworth even proved that. Uh, why do you think the critics are so, so hard on you guys when the, obviously the audiences loved you at Nebworth? Uh, That's the reason. In case the people don't know, 250,000 people <coughs> came one particular weekend. The next weekend it was something like 200,000 people from all over Europe, from all over the United States. And the gig was still play. half empty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and even the critics tore you up even that night. And I thought you were excellent. I thought the first two numbers were a little shaky in the night as well. Yeah. Then you straightened it out and off you were. Well, that was it. It was good. And they, I think everybody waits for a band. They build you up, help you get there. You're always eternally grateful. And then suddenly you find you, all the old guys that you knew are being removed. And the guys who come up next, <clears throat> the guys who've been employed you know, tack it all away, take it all away from the bottom. And it was always popular. And that was another thing. People were waiting. I think the press were waiting for the day when we really couldn't turn it on. And it never came. So they had to start the, the business themselves. It was good sport. <laughs> I mean, we even suggested in England, uh, Phil Carson from Atlantic Records said, 
well, why don't we write our own review of the album and send it with the, with the record, you know? Are you surprised by uh, Zeppelin? And, and of course, I'm sure you're going to see now with the release of this record, your continued su success in this country. I mean, your popularity is still as strong today as it was, I would say, back in 77 when you last toured. You turn on the radio, you still hear your music. Yeah, but this is different. This is, this is not the old regime. This is a new sketch. So, I mean, who can say what will happen? No, but I mean, I'm really interested. I mean, whatever anybody thinks in the business, if you call it the business, and people who've heard the record, people who may like it or may not like it, it's interesting. It's an interesting phase to see. Yeah. But you're an integral part of that sound. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It wasn't like you were the, on the back burner. You were an integral part of the sound that came out of that particular band. And you can still come to New York or Los Angeles or wherever in this country and, have a good and, time. Still, and still hear that music coming over. Mm. Uh, yeah. So our, And people have been waiting for your album, you know, with bated breath. Could be, be just because you are who you are and your roots were what they were. Don't you find that still kind of surprising? And since the last time, like, not, not only were the, were the, was the last time the band was seen was in 79, but the last time the band had an album mm. was in 79. And yet, usually, with other bands, once that happens, the band is a demise or whatever, they go away, a lot of popularity goes away, and you don't hear it on the radio. Radio wouldn't play it if they didn't think people wanted to hear it. Mm, it's true, it's very flattering, incredibly flattering. But, I mean, uh, flattery's great, and, uh, <clears throat> and the music also stood up for itself. As I said before, I mean, it all made sense. But, uh, oh, I don't know, how much longer does it go on? Mm. In a way, you know, you, all of you guys kind of paved the way for um, blues-based hard rock and roll bands like uh, Van Halen, ACDC, and even in a way, Rush, I'd say, even though they're not really blues-based. Mm. Uh, do you like their music in any way? I like the Stray Cats. Ah, so you like rockabilly. I like, yeah, I like the Stray Cats. I like the Blasters. Fabulous Thunderbirds. I mean, <clears throat> I like music that cooks, that people are having a good time making, you know? Have you heard the Blasters album? Yes. Great. And the Stray Cats as well. Stray mm. Cats started, uh, I think they are, they're from New, New York, and then they went to Los Angeles. It didn't happen there, and they went to England, and it started to happen. Mm. Brian's just come back to New York now. They got, uh, they're doing some work around New York very shortly. But they're great. I mean, they're really, it's like very vital, very unaffected. When we last spoke in 79, we, t we spoke about rockabilly music. Mm. And because uh, and, I know that your roots are basically blues-based and rockabilly-based. Mm -hmm. But yet, the only thing I ever remember sounding rockabilly coming from uh, in past work you've done was Hot Dog. And Candy Store Rock. I mean, can mm, uh, yeah, presence, definitely. Yeah. That was the intention was to sort of <clears throat> to try and fill that gap a little bit, you know, because there was obviously a lot of blues-based material that came through the Reeves and Ears on this, uh, yes. on this album now, you know. But, I mean, the rockabilly side is very light, but very, uh, very good intention. And going back with the Stray Cats, I mean, I've s I saw them when they first came to England, they were in a small club, they were good. Then they hit the kind of big stage theatres and stuff, and it was still really convincing, you know. I can't understand how they aren't enormous in America. I think they will be with the new album and coming over to tour. We, we, can we uh, look for, like, maybe a rockabilly style, maybe a song or two on your next al album? Maybe the odd tune. <laughs> Put five dollars in the cognac glass. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not ready for Bourbon Street yet, but... Uh, I don't think so. I don't think mm. so. I think I like, I like, when it's down to writing, it's down to playing, it's down to creating an atmosphere through records, I like to do it the other way. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a distinct difference. I mean, it's great having a good time, but it's great to actually take something that's a simple idea and make it into a real wah, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, listen, a lot of, I, I hate, in a way, go back to this, but it's just one thing that I know that uh, so many young kids not familiar with it. the name Led Zeppelin when <coughs> it came around, right? Hello, I've never heard this before. I've never been asked this before. Right. The rumor that Keith Moon named the band, is that true? Mm. Could you tell us the story how that went down? Well, I can only tell you what I've been told because I wasn't around, you see. I came along a little later. But there was going to be some kind of super band, of which there have been millions, but this was going to be the first super band. I think names that were mentioned, and it could be completely wrong, and out of context was Steve Winwood, Steve Marriott, Keith Moon, I mean, even Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page together in the Holt. It was almost like a caravan of, uh, of brilliance, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, it didn't come to much, but during the talk about it, maybe it was just talk in a club, but it was in the air. And while it was in the air, Mooney gave it that name. He said that, you know, where you tell a joke in America, <coughs> it goes down like a lead balloon, it's a flop. So if you start off using the term flop, then it can't get any worse, can it? <laughs> 
So that's how Led Zeppelin came about. Mm. You know, I didn't even know that after all these years of knowing I you. thought you were just saying it because we no, were on that. Honestly, I really didn't know that after all these years. All right. In fact, I do remember the last time I saw Bonzo and uh, John Bonham and, uh, <laughs> and Keith Moon on stage together, if you remember, in 77. Yeah, there was no Los room Angeles. for anybody else once they yeah, started. In Los Angeles. And, uh, and of course, with, uh, what with Mooney's death, the, the Who replaced as best they could with Kenny Kenny Jones on drums, and of course, even when Brian Jones uh, passed away, well, even a month before then, the Rolling Stones had replaced Brian. Why did you find it not the thing to do, shall we say, to try to find a replacement for, for Bonzo? Well, there's one thing, there are many things, but there's one thing far more important than keeping a group going, and that is how you feel about people, you know? Mm -hmm. And I mean, for all the sort of rows and whatever we've gone through, we were the ultimate unit on stage was one thing, but off stage and how we felt, how we were, <coughs> there was no room for replacements. Mm. There was no room to have anybody, you know, there was, that was secondary. The idea of continuing by sticking somebody else back there on the rostrum was just bad taste. Uh -huh. Tell me this too, this is the last thing I'll say on, on that particular question. When one... It's not that dramatic, it's just like a a kind of tribute to John. Like, I mean, we would have never been half as good if you listen to those records. I mean, it was like dynamite. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, he used to give me some stick. But nevertheless, I mean, that's it, you know. Well, least. I obviously know what a fine drummer he was. I think one of the things for anybody listening to Led Zeppelin's music and all the big tunes that everybody's heard and, and they're quite popular, to, to listen to his drumming on the live version, on the live album, on the No Quarter, Mm. and all the textures and, that he goes through on it. Mm. And you can see what a fine drummer he yeah. is. And what anybody else would have, however good they'd have been, even if they'd have been uh, better in one aspect than John, which I would have, it would be very hard to find anybody anywhere. But I mean, even so, I mean, he had it overall. He had so much taste and so much feel. That's it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more I can say. When one uh, dies like that prematurely, it leaves all sorts of funny emotions, I think, with people. Uh, even sometimes bitterness, not so much bitterness because you miss the person, but also bitterness because you miss that person's creativity in this kind of situation. Was that a bit of a problem for you in any way? No. I just lost my mate. Mm -hmm. Do you have any existing... In other words, is it possible in the future that we could hear... I'm sure there had to be some material that all of you had worked on that might possibly be released in the future if you all decide to do so? Well, anything's possible. I mean, I don't want to be vague, but I mean, mm -hmm. I haven't really given it a great deal of thought personally. It's another one of those suck it and see jobs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Morning. Yeah. Would you tell the audience, because we had a news story not too long ago about Bonzo's son, Jason, and what a brilliant drummer he is. And you know, I tried to explain to the people that it wasn't just like a send-up, that the kid really is a fine percussionist. Excellent, uh, yeah. yeah. We did a sound check for Nebworth. <clears throat> this remarkably big concert you were on about and the stage was about 40 50 feet off the ground some ridiculous height and uh three days before the gig we went down there and jason came with us and he played with the band while bonzo went out front to hear what it was like mm -hmm. i think i don't know what we did but it was great and it was really funny because i mean he really hit the drums but at the same time the sound engineers were like whacking the sound up mm -hmm. And there was something like a 100,000 watt PA, something really over the top. Fortunately, we needed it. But anyway, that night we had complaints from seven miles away because of the sand. It was that loud. And he helped to contribute to the complaints. <laughs> it was great. Then he went back to school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a great little kid, great drummer. He's, you know, I hope he does well. Do you think he'll be going on to do that professionally? Well, I don't know. I mean, he's, uh, he's at the age now where he's, like, doing all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, How old is he now? Fifteen. Mm -hmm. How would good. you feel if your children decided to go into rock and roll? What, with my, <coughs> with my background? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't let him get anywhere near it. <laughs> mm. I can't stand people who tell lies. <laughs> Are you in touch with the, uh, with the rest of the guys uh, at all nowadays, Jimmy and John Paul? Yeah, I see Jimmy occasionally. Uh, I, Jonesy, not so often. He's immersed in whatever he's doing, you know. It, does, is any of that musical? Is Jonesy such a brilliant musician? I, I think in, in a lot of ways people didn't realize because an awful lot of attention, and to no fault mm -hmm. of your own, but was given to you and to Jimmy, and even to Bonzo, 
But mm -hmm. in a way, you know, Jonesy was like the anchor. Jonesy liked it like that, though. That's yeah, how he, he preferred it. It was great, because we used to stay in hotels and then in the morning. We'd tend to get up at least before noon, while there were other members of the entourage who had to be got up for the gig sometimes, mm -hmm. you know? So <clears throat> we used to go out walking together, and maybe we'd make it about 500 yards from the hotel, where I, I'd have to turn around and scamper back, which really isn't particularly good fun, you know? But Jonesy could keep on striding out. <laughs> Right, sort of <laughs> the ultimate optimist. <laughs> Except for in the end, he got a bit cheesed off because nobody knew who he was anyway. You know. <laughs> Do you think the, the three of you may ever play again together at some point further on down the road? I don't know. I really don't know. Mm. That's not the time to even think about it. In '79. You surprised me in the interview we did. You told me that you wanted to be remembered for, and I was waiting for all sorts of songs. But the song was for all of my love. And mm. you said you, that at that time, up to <clears> that point, you considered it to be uh, your most definitive work. Do you still feel that? Well, I think I was in the middle of that whole beautiful thing that was going on. I, mean, I use beautiful not in inverted commas. It was nice, you know. Mm. And that was the mo one of the more recent things that we'd done that I really liked. It was very melodic very simple. It was, <clears throat> if you like, closer to Brill building material, you know, all the sort of Goffin King stuff, the nice, short, crisp song. So at that time I probably said that and I probably meant it. But I mean, if you look, and now as I look back, there's loads of things. I mean, what can I say? In fact, there's a song on the new album that reminds me very, very much of it. You know, and um, I was wondering, well, maybe, obviously, it's not, because you're not feeling that. I was going to say, I thought maybe there might be an extension on the new album, because there are two beautiful ballads on the new album, you know. But you've always had that romantic side to you. Hmm, you know? I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I guess, really, uh, that's, why, that's why you sing, that's why you write, because there's that, you know, you can't just sing about streets and hotels and, <clears throat> and chicks trying to get in the limousine, mm -hmm. you know. Emotion's very important. You co-wrote and you sang probably one of, I'd have to say certainly at least one of the two or the three definitive classic rock and roll songs in Stairway to Heaven. So many years now, looking back on it, in retrospect, how do you feel it still stands up? How do you feel about it today? Well, I'm amazed. I mean, I don't want to appear... Uh, I don't know, really. I mean, I've heard it that many times, and I know that it was a nice song, it had a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it was a, just a, a nice song. I mean, it's just very flattering. It's also the dynamics of this song. Mm, I of course, I know yeah. that, but I mean, you're asking me, I'm going to be nice and sort of, <laughs> hey, what does it mean to me? <laughs> your, your voice continues to be in top form, and you haven't, uh, like I said, other than the honey drippers, you haven't been really singing professionally for some time. How do you manage to keep it in shape? Because you run it from a range of very, very deep. It's one of the things I've always been amazed by your voice, where you can come way down and then bring it way up there. And I'd imagine you'd have to keep your pipes in shape for that. How do you do that? Nicotine, tobacco, <laughs> I haven't got a clue, I don't know. Some days it works and some days it doesn't. I mean, on the movie, the song remains the same. I do Black Dog about 3,000 octaves lower than it should be. Mm -hmm. And people are co constantly saying, hey, you, that's no good. But the job was done. Sometimes when you're tired, it doesn't happen. You know that. Yes, I do. <laughs> 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 Could you tell us who influenced your style when you first started singing, long before you actually got into the business of music? Uh, yeah, Ray Charles. Really? Yeah, I thought Ray Charles was... I mean, apart from the Chicago blues guys, Howlin' Wolf and all that, Ray Charles had so much style. <clears throat> and it was a little smoother. It was like a sort of... Ray Charles was influenced by Nat King Cole, so you've got that, you know, going back. And then Steve Winwood, although the same age as me, was in a band called Spencer Davis Group. And he was doing things like Drowning My Own Tears. And he was giving a more youthful, white voice interpretation of that kind of... Mm -hmm. black music you know that's a good question it leads into a good question i believe because in uh, you go to england and obviously you do have blacks in england but at the same time the music that seems to be the basis of rock and roll which mm. truthfully i must admit and especially in the 60s if not so much so today but still came back to us from america right black blues was here in america mm. picked up by people like zeppelin rolling mm. stones given back to us in this country. But it's not indigenous of England. Uh, wh how could that music take such hold in a country that really has nothing to do with it? I've no idea. <clears throat> I know when I was a kid, it was such an alternative to listen to, to what I'd got around me. 
I mean, Herman's Hermits and uh, that sort of real sugary pop music had got absolutely no depth to it. It was like something that began, <clears throat> and a minute, 55 seconds later, it stopped. Now, some of the classic minute and 55 seconds later stops over here were things like Love Persian Number 9 by The Clovers, you know? It Will Stand by The Showmen. Lipstick Traces, Benny Spellman, great R&B. You know, sea Cruise, Frankie Ford, loads of Chris Kennard, and all these R&B guys, you know? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it was real grit. It was like a nice alternative. But in England now, black music does hold. And that is, and it's our own English black music. And that's <clears throat> the music from the West Indian community. And combinations between black and white, like bands like The Beat. I don't know whether they've been to America. Yes, the English Beat, you yeah. mean. Yeah, incredible band. Great combination of the sort of two cultures, stick it together, and you've got Mirror in the Bathroom. Incredible, mm -hmm. you know. Can you describe the difference between Robert Plant uh, on stage, as you would see him, and Robert Plant off stage? Well, I've got a dollar in my pocket now. <laughs> <laughs> Never carry money on stage. No, but this, that whole persona changes. I don't think it does. I think I just sit on it a bit more off stage. <laughs> One of the things I've always liked about your image, because you never actually went about trying to make an image, it just happened for you. But part of that image is being a, a sex symbol in a way. You know? And uh, there again, I said, there's something I've never seen you cultivate in all the years that I've known you. But is it hard dealing with that when you come off stage, shall we say? On stage you can play that role, but when you're off stage... I think I purposely try to do it, it's just that none of my shirts fit. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't do it now. Uh, you know, I can't be serious about it is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it's great fun dancing around, but I mean, how serious do you take it? If there would be one thing that you could change about yourself, Robert, what would it be? <laughs> Uh, I haven't got a clue. What a great question. What's one thing I could change about myself? I can't say. I don't know. I'd stop telling lies. <laughs> You'll never stop doing that, because you do it in such a charming way. Listen, Led Zeppelin in many ways represented a particular era. I era. Think, era. Not an era. Era. <laughs> yeah. Era. Time and space. Yeah. Ten years, decade. Um, could you describe your contribution? What do you think the, contri the contribution of the band and the music was to the 70s? Um, um, I don't know. I think it was just very urgent. You know, I can use that term. Yeah, I think it was just very full of life, very full of urgency, and yet it also had the ability to span through <clears throat> from one side or one end of the emotion right the way across to the other, from elation to sadness. I mean, it was just uh, all around good, take it how would you like when it one day it is all it will obviously at one point and i hope not in the near future but it come to an all an end how would you like to be remembered you know professionally musically being a great soccer player i haven't i've have never even thought about it i don't see any end no mm -mm. Well, look, I mean, a bit of makeup and look what happens it's perfect isn't it <laughs> <laughs> no i asked that because i know that if i were to ask you about Robert Johnson and what his contribution was to the blues that you could tell me, mm. you know? Yeah, me? I don't know. I mean, I can't, I can't stand that far away from myself to really see. And what can we expect in the future? Because I get a feeling you've got all new goals and this new energy surging through you, you know, and new ideas. You know, can you give us any idea of what we can expect from Robert you know, over the next couple of years? Well, I th a steady flow of albums and all being well touring. And apart from that, there's so many new things that are going on that I must play with them all. Yes, well, you're welcome to come back and play on our set anytime you want. You know that, Robert. Thanks. And please consider touring again. You know, when you can get it together and you get enough material to go out on the road, because you can always take your material and all those great old blues and rockabilly numbers you know and do that, you know. But we want to see you perform again. We miss you on stage. I wait to perform. <laughs> Thank you so much. One question. Uh, yeah, I just want to ask one question one more time with Robert sitting okay. here. He, he asked you to explain who the honey, honey drippers are, right? Mm -hmm. You said, could you explain for our audience who the honey drippers are? Ah, yes. Okay, you said, Jay? Yes. You got it. Door, please. Door, please. We are not finished. You can just look at Jay Jay as if you were going to ask the question. You don't have to.
Mm. Well, could you do us a favor and not smoke? Because you weren't smoking. Hey, when that's we pretty asked slick. That question. <laughs> Spot the okay. deliberate mistake. Right, yeah. right after this, I'll let you smoke. Okay, okay, we're gonna do this two times. Okay. okay? Two times? Yeah, two okay. different shots for us. Okay. Mm -hmm. You've got the question. Fine. Don't laugh. You are. Here we go. <laughs> no, no, it's terrible. I can't do. I'm doing lines all the time. Sorry. That's okay. Here we go. Okay, in three, two. Would you please explain to our audience who the honey drippers are? You don't want me to answer that. Right, right. No, no, no. We've got your answer ready. You oh, my God. Time, right? Okay. This We're is going to ask that same question one more time. This is better than touring. Is this <laughs> is great because you do it all sitting here. Well, come back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is We're just going to ask it once again. Very product good. of the 80s. A child of the 80s. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah, JJ. Here we go. All right, Jay? Yeah. Anytime. Robert, would you explain to our audience who the honey drippers are? <laughs> uh, okay. And now looking at me, taking the right, question? Right, if we can just, uh, no, we're just going to, if you guys can chat among yourselves, we're just going to okay. get some shots of you cutting away. Okay. How long are you going to stay in town? Two days. Are you right back? Are you home? I think so, yeah. England are playing uh, Tunisia on, not Tunisia. Uh, <laughs> they got the last game in their series on Friday, so I want to go back and watch it oh, yeah. with English uh, talk over. And I also want to see the world baby. I want to see pictures and stuff. I don't want to be here too long. Mm -hmm. It's great to be here. I'm in the buzz when I got off the plane. Well, you always liked New York, didn't you? Yeah, I did, but I'm... It's strange being here on my own. It's amazing. The amount of sort of... I haven't got to take anybody else into consideration at all. It's, That's right. It's great. It's intoxicating. But, I mean, it's just like... <laughs> yeah. I just oh, want to have a little yeah, touch of it now, so as I go back, yeah. especially now, because things are... Can I just take that cigarette from you for about 30 seconds? Okay. Because <laughs> <Okay. clears throat> everybody's eager and really trotting around the record, so yeah. there's a whole spin over, you know? Mm -hmm. Like everybody's getting very excited, and I am not used to this. I mean, I've never oh, been in on the, the release of an album. Thank you. Cheers. You know what, though? Do you remember back in 79 when we talked, and I thought and okay, it was impossible for you to do so at the time? Okay. We talked about possibility a possibility of playing a small club, right? you know, like you said, you know, because of the legs. Mm. Right. All right, now that this album's been out of right. a while, should be on you know, I'm seriously thinking about touring, because <coughs> you could do what you wanted to do the album, and do all those things you wanted to do. This is, you know, if there's anything good to come out of all of this, mm. you know, it will give you that freedom to do it. Exactly, yeah. <coughs> Okay. I have okay. to jump in here, Chris, yeah, they're going to take you away. Dragging this is like a radio Okay, your mic's off. Our slogan is There you go, good job. You'll never look at me the same way again, you mean? That's for sure. <laughs> uh, can I do a couple of runs? You sure can. Because I'm not used to these big things. Okay. Tell me when you want me to go. Right, I'll let you know when you're rolling. I'll just try that. Um, this is quite... When, when you're finished. Okay. Don't, don't look away real quick. But that's when I go coy. Right. <laughs> and when I smile, it gets right. really... There you go. Okay, he's just going to go. Let me know when you Okay, anytime you'd like to begin. Go ahead. Very quiet, please, folks. Here we go. Anytime, Robert. Hi, I'm Robert Plant on MTV Music Television, the world's first 24-hour music channel in stereo. You'll never look at music the same again. <laughs> Great. Can you stay looking at Robert? Sure. We still have cutaways going on with you. Okay? Let's try it again. Oh, I like that. Fine. Still rolling, right? Okay. Right. Here we go, folks. Very quiet. Anytime. Hi, I'm Robert Plant on MTV Music Television, the world's first 24-hour music channel in stereo. You'll never look at music the same again. It's not in the process? Yeah. Oh, he's bandy though, isn't he? Okay. No He'd had the special the rubber pills. pills. <laughs> Some people take okay. water tablets. There you go. Take it. Yeah. Oh, I've never seen such amateurism in my life. That's great. <laughs> you can smoke that if you like. Stay, oh, that's okay. I got a call. I, I Stay looking at Yeah, I have to do it. Really? But I mean, I panic when I'm on my own. Yeah. <coughs> I have to have lots of room service. Okay. Very quiet, please, yeah. folks. Here we go. Anytime, Robert. Hi. I'm Robert Plant on MTV Music Television the world's first 24-hour music channel in stereo. You'll never look at music the same way again. Ooh, that's a good 
Oh, Great. JJ, you can just talk. Just try to clear the It's like going with the wind. No <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh my goodness, he's hamming. This is great. Yeah, <laughs> for August 1st for our birthday, okay? Okay. When are you ready? You ready? Anytime, Robert. Very quietly. Hi, I'm Robert Plant, and happy birthday, MTV. Great. If we yes. can just have JJ talk. Oh, you have another one? Yeah, I got it. Oh, she's got one more. What? What does that mean to me? The countdown to our birthday. 23. 23 days to go. We're doing it this moment. Okay, you just say 23 days to go. I'm not, I'm not. I'm Very dramatic. It's our countdown. We can't do the countdown. Quiet, please. Right. <coughs> okay, he's just going to do uh, just the number countdown for us. Very quiet, please, folks. Anytime. Right? 23. 23 days to go. All that and no drama school. Okay. <laughs> I, I just need one quick cut away. Don't okay, then we'll let you guys go. <laughs> Jen, if you can just talk with Robert for a little bit. Yeah. Okay, mostly you talking, but keeping still. Okay. This is setting my soul. This is tell I can't do all this spiel. Oh, sure. Phil, get me out of this instead of waffling to an executive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, somebody with a suit on that fits then. Exactly. I can't do all this, miss. You're I, done. Oh, you're no, done. done. You're done. You no, can you're done. Oh, you're done. no, I, I'm sorry. No. I to you're done. No, you're right. sorry. <coughs> I just need you to chat with JJ for just a few minutes. No, you're done. Okay? I just need you two guys to chat without the cigarette again. Oh. I'll light you another one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's all right. Can I drink some Perrier, please? <laughs> yes. No, you can. It's right there. Yeah, I know. Cheers. JJ, talk to, to a new whatever it is. Well, both of us, really. Oh. Three years, 13 years being this jockey, mate, and here I am. You know, do you realize we've known each other 14 years? I've known my wife 18. <clears throat> Same sort of thing. Yeah. What's yeah, it's mean? another world altogether, isn't it? We're both starting to get away kind of new careers, because this is new for me. I've you know, been doing it about a year now. <clears throat> so, what we did earlier on, will come out this evening. No, that's going to be on tomorrow night's show. Oh, is it? Yeah. Then maybe I would have a look at that. Do you want to see it? Tomorrow, yeah. Yeah, we're not Of course, we've got the provision to play back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be on tomorrow night's show. Because what we do is normally, like, on Monday, we, we actually do Monday's show for Monday, mm. but on Tuesday, so we can have the weekend, because we're 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we can't, you know, you have, gotta have a day off. So on Tuesdays and Wednesdays... my wrong side. Tuesdays and Wednesdays we shoot what we call 48 hours a day. Thanks for your patience okay. and everything else. Pleasure. And